module eight is now open online. There's um, some stuff there. There's two example notebooks. Um, the second one doesn't quite have the comments in it. The first one is commented and ready to go. That's the one that um, we'll use on, uh, on Thursday in class. And um, the, you'll just see in there, one's like uh, 08.3a and the other is 0.3b. So they're, they're both linked there, they're up. I just haven't finished all of the comments for the second notebook. Um, so the topic of this uh, module is, um, is on model calibration. Um, and the terminology I'm going to use around this is, right, there's, there's a whole bunch of different terminology around this idea of calibration. So you may hear it referred to as optimization, right? You may, um, you may hear it referred to um, as parameter estimation or just as estimation. Um, but in, in the context of a lot of earth and environmental systems, we refer to this process as calibration. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so model calibration. And the idea here, right, um, if, if we go back to like way back at the beginning of the semester, right, and we, we, we pose a model. So if we recall um, our box model of a watershed, Right, and, and we had a couple of, uh, of system equations here, right? So, we, so this was, if we just draw a picture real quick, here's our watershed, right? And into that watershed is coming uh, precipitation. Out of that watershed is coming discharge and another flux out of that watershed was the evapotranspiration, right? Um, it, and when we wrote the, and, and there's this idea of a storage variable S, right? So that's the storage. And, right, when we wrote the, the system equation for this, it looked like this, right? So. The mass conservation equation was that the change in storage with respect to time was just equal to what was coming in, which is precipitation, minus everything that was going out, right, which was the discharge plus the ET. Okay. And um, if you recall, Right, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to rewrite this slightly so that I group this P minus ET here, and I'll call this something like the, the net precipitation. Right, and then we have a minus Q term here, right? So this P minus ET is just kind of effectively the, the water that kind of gets below the root zone that in principle will ultimately make it out into, into discharge, right? So this is the amount of precipitation that's actually gonna contribute to discharge at the outlet of the watershed. And if you further remember, right, we, what we needed to, in order to be able to solve this equation was a, a so-called parameterization or some way of representing the, the discharge in the watershed. Right, and so what we did is we um, we invoked a linear reservoir which just said that Q was equal to some constant K times this variable storage, right? And so when we 
inserted this, right? Um, so inserting this relationship. Right, we, we got an equation that looked like the change in storage with respect to time is equal to P minus ET minus K times this storage, right? And so what we need to run this model Right, is uh, we need precipitation, right? So we need something like, you know, for instance, daily precip obs, right? We need some estimate of evapotranspiration. And, and these uh, we're going to refer to as our um, forcing variables, right? Because these are what are, are forcing the model, right? They're what's kind of, you know, ringing the bell, so to speak, okay? We need an initial value of S. We'll call this a guess. And the, right, there's a lot I could say about this, this variable S, this, this initial guess of, of, st of storage, right? Um, the, the most important one, perhaps, is that this variable sto storage, S, is a conceptual variable, right? Like, it's... Um, Yes, an actual storage amount of watershed, st storage amount of water in the watershed exists. Um, but that's a really complicated variable. It contains all of the groundwater, all of the soil moisture, all of the snow, all of the water that's retained on the surfaces of the leaves, the water that's in the leaves, right? The water that's in the creatures that are inside our watershed that's a really sort of complicated variable. We're reducing that down to just kind of this, you know, almost mythical value S. So, you know, S zero is sort of just a guess of that, or we would guess the model and run it, you know, guess that value and run it for a really long time until it sort of stabilizes given our, our forcings, okay? That's a whole sort of side issue with respect to how we construct and conceptualize models. We covered a little bit of that way back when we talked about box models. This is, you know, this is a box model. Um, but that's not what I wanna sort of talk about here. What we're gonna talk about here is this idea that we need, we need K, right? This is our parameter. This is our storage discharge. parameter. Okay. And, um, you know, we have some, right, like, uh, there's some, there's some things we can infer about what exactly K is or represents, right? If we, if we go back and look up at the parameterization of what K is, right? Um, K basically is, is just, you know, if, if we look at this, here's our storage variable. This has units of like volume. Discharge has units of, you know, uh, volume per time, right? Like cubic meters per day or cubic meters per second. 
right? And so the units on K have to be something like one over time. Um, and so this variable K represents essentially the fraction of storage in any given time step that is going to be released from our watershed as, as discharge, right, as, as flow. And so, you know, we, we at least have some, you know, some realistic conceptual bounds on this, right? You can't lose less than zero of a fraction, right? So a negative value for K wouldn't make any sense. We would actually be adding mass if K was negative. And it can't be more than one, right? Like a watershed can't lose more than its entire volume of storage in any given time step. So at least we have, you know, some very large kind of end member bounds on what K has to be. But aside from that, we don't really have a good, right? Again, because this is, like I said, a, a mythical variable S, right? We, we don't have a really good way to figure out what, right, what K, what exactly K is, okay? Now, on the other hand, right, its relationship, right, K relates this variable storage, this conceptual variable storage, to something that we are actually observing, right, which is the, the discharge, okay? We can actually go and install uh, a pressure transducer and measure the velocity and develop a relationship between, you know, how this, the, the so-called stage discharge relationship where if you know the depth, you know the outflow, the discharge. So we can, we can get a good estimate of, of Q. And indeed, that's exactly what the US Geological Sur Survey water mission area, that's one of the big things they do, is they have all of these discharge observations all throughout the United States and its territories to measure stream flow, to measure discharge. So the question is, is how, do we, how then do we constrain K, right, such that, such that we are, you know, that our model, given our observed precipitation, right, and given our, um, and given our observed discharge, right, what we would like to do is, is ensure that whatever discharge this model is producing is realistic with respect to those observations, okay? So, so the effort of, the effort of finding a value of K that minimizes some measure of model performance and this is error errors in the prediction of discharge is called calibration, okay? So there's a lot to be said about calibration. There could be entire classes that you could take about calibration, right? Um, there are tons of, there's lots of philosophies, philosophies about calibration. There's hundreds of dissertations written about this just in the context of hydrologic modeling. Okay, so there's no way that we can co cover the possible kind of realm of calibration in, you know, two weeks, a two week module. Okay, but there are some really essential elements of calibration that we will cover. And you'll actually be able to do this with 
um, a couple of models that uh, we're going to be using this week and next. Actually, they're related. One model just contains the other. So we're going to calibrate the first part of it first, and then the second part of it next week. Okay. So before we go any further, let's draw kind of what this looks like. So what does calibration look like? So if I draw a couple of figures here, right? So this is going to be my precipitation, right? And let's say that I have kind of a few events right here. Right, so here's one rainstorm. Here's maybe a bigger one. And maybe here's a small one out here. Right, so this is time. Okay. And then this is going to be my discharge Q, okay? And um, we're going to have an observed discharge, right? So something that looks like this. Right, so this is the observed discharge. And then we're going to have what our model predicts, right? And so let's just say this is This is our model discharge. And as you might surmise, right, our, our model in all likelihood is not going to fit our observations. There are going to be times when the model is lower than the observations, right? So if we just go through and start kind of drawing and, and characterizing some of the kinds of errors that we have here, right? So here we have the model is too low. Right here we have the model is too high. And what other, what other things can we observe about these two hydrographs besides just the, the peaks? We don't have the same issue on the Yeah, so they don't agree here at the start, right? So. Right, so we have an initial error that may indicate that, right, our model was initialized incorrectly. Other thoughts? What are the attributes of the hydrograph might we care about? About why the, the initial points are different? Yeah, so we'll. Yeah, we definitely care about kind of why they're different. But let's kind of, let's also sort of just characterize how, right, like how they're different. Because once we know how they're different, we'll be able to maybe specify a little bit more why they're different. 
Yeah, so that's maybe important, right? So what does the area under this curve represent? Total yeah, like the total volume over some period of time, right? So their, their volumes, volumes, area under curve, doesn't match. Right. One that we think about a lot, right, um, in, in terms of hazards and hydrology and floods in particular is the timing of this. Right. So the timing is not correct. In this case, the, the model is a bit too slow to respond. Why is that problematic from a hazard perspective? Yeah, right. So like if this is a forecast. And the forecast is like, oh, you have another day before things get really bad and you're wrong. There's a really potentially bad consequences for that. OK. And then there's there's some other things too, other subtleties. Right. So obviously the, the curves are separated from one another, but the timing in which they're separated from one another maybe matters. Right. So here we have kind of, you know, these are errors in, in the low flow part low flow errors and you know we also have already sort of documented some some uh, high flow errors right right and, and this this also matters right again it's important to think about when we calibrate a model this is a really important part right is why are we using this model right are we using this model because um, for instance, we need to design a bridge that is high enough to clear this kind of observed peak flow or a peak flow under a precipitation storm event that we've never observed and we have to model, right? Um, because if you get this wrong, right, you might put your bridge too low and then it might overtop, okay? Are you designing it for or are you, are you using the model to ask questions about, you know, how might fish habitat change in, in a future climate when there's less discharge, right? Um, if I, if I want to measure, for instance, like, you know, what's the lowest seven-day period you're likely to encounter over a 10-year period in, in the future, once every 10 years, the so-called 7Q10, right? Um, I, I really care about the low flow part of the hydrograph, right? Because, you know, we, we want to understand, you know, what climate change might do to fish refugia, right? The volume is maybe super important if I am thinking about using this model to make water supply forecasts, right? So I want to use this model at the beginning of the year to understand, okay, how many acre feet of water are we going to have for irrigation this year? Do I actually need to start writing those curtailment notices to send to farmers? Because that's, that could be dicey, right? And if, and maybe instead what I can do is put out a informal call and say, Hey, is anybody planning on not using their, their allotment? It looks like it's going to be a lot drier this year. It would help us out a lot. Right? So all of this is to say that which of these measures is kind of most important to calibrate to is very much a product of what you're going to use the model for, okay? Okay, so what I wanna to do today is just go through a few important, um, right? The, the, the next question though, right, is, is how do we measure, right? What are different ways that we can measure the performance of this model so-called objectively, right? Um, you know, by calculating some metric of error between our model and the observation in ways that would give me some number that I know is, you know, that I can vary my parameters and, you know, try and reduce, for instance, right? Some measure of error, right? So the next part of this is going to talk about performance
measures. Okay. And what I want to do here is draw another diagram. This is going to be a simpler version of the previous one. Right, so this is discharge. Again, our model discharge will be here in blue. And our, uh, no, this is our observed, sorry, I want to keep my colors consistent. So this is, I'm going to call this QO for observed. And this is going to be Q QM for modeled. Okay. And the idea is, is that these are actually sort of not, despite the way it's drawn, these are not continuous functions, right? We, what we actually have is kind of like an, an observation of discharge that's like an average for the day, right? So this might be the measured discharge and the predicted discharge on this given day, right? So this is these curves are discrete. at some time interval delta t, okay? Okay. So, so let's talk about a few different things we could do, right? So at, at any given time, right? So at any given time, oops, the error between the observations and models can be computed as, we'll say epsilon equals Q Epsilon at time i equals q modeled at time i minus q o at time i. Okay. So what we do with that error and how we compute that error over the course of this entire you know, period of record or period of calibration is, is important. And, and one thing that I want to underscore to you here right, is that almost always we're going to be dealing with um, either an unsigned or a squared quantity of this error. And I want to draw a picture as to why that's important, okay? So, so if we look at this, uh, not Cal's case, case. So, um, and let's not say that this is discharge. This is just something else. This is some quantity. Uh, we will call it M. Okay. And let's say that 
here is our observation, right? So it doesn't change at all over this period, right? So this is our observation. And let's say here is our model. So if we look at the error here and the error here, right, so let's call this time one, let's call this time two, okay, and at time one, Epsilon one equals Q M one minus Q O one. And in this case, the observation is higher than the model, meaning that this error is going to be less than zero. And at time two, the model is higher than the observation, meaning this quantity will be greater than zero. And the point at which they cross is kind of exactly midway in our period in which we're evaluating the observations or evaluating our model performance, okay? So if we took the sum of these two, right, like let's say that these are kind of equal distances away from the, the edges, right? So if this line sort of exactly crosses midway through this observation or this, this calibration period, the slope is constant and T1 and T2 sort of are exactly at the same time away from the beginning and the end. If we add these two errors together without considering their sign, what, what are we going to get? Zero error. Yeah, exactly, right? So if we sum these, we're going to get zero, right? The term for this, right, is that the error at one of these times compensated for the error at one of these other times, okay? So what we don't want to do is, uh, let me undo that, put this in a different color, right? We, we don't want to take Right, just, just a raw sum of the errors, okay, in most cases, because we can get this issue of sort of compen you know, compensating errors. Our errors that are positive sometimes will sort of cancel out the errors that are negative at other times. We'll get, right, a much different inference about how our model is performing than the observations, right? This would not be a good model. I mean, maybe it would be but this is not a good way to measure the error, okay? All right, so what are some ways that we would measure the error, right? So what are, so some first order, I don't wanna call them first order, um, some common ways of measuring error. So the first one we'll talk about is the so-called mean absolute error, which effectively gets around this issue that we just had an aside about 
by taking the absolute value of the error at any of those times, right? So the mean absolute error is just 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of the absolute value of our modeled minus our observed time series. All right, this is the mean absolute error. Okay. So if if we look at this right and we if we're looking at this from sort of a, a physically based perspective the the advantages of the mean absolute error are that the error is in units of whatever it is we're measuring. Right? So we will we will get the um we will we'll, we will get the the air will be expressed in a term of like for instance meters cubed per second right so if if we say you know the mean absolute air is 2 cubic meters per second that has some physical meaning or context we have physical meaning or context for that right now it might depend right like are we talking cu 2 cubic meters per second like you know in the parking lot, right, in a small culvert, we're we talking two cubic meters per second in the Mississippi, right? So we still have issues of scale, right? Is that a big error? I don't know. I can't, I can't tell that directly from computing the mean absolute error, okay? But I will get it in sort of some meaningful quantity, okay? All right, so the next common one would be to compute and we'll take a break right after this one. The mean, oops, the mean squared error which as the name implies is just the mean um, and I can't remember if this is n minus one or n. I think it's minus one. I'll double check that. And this is from i equals one to n. And as the name would imply, we will compute the difference between the, the model and the observation at each time step and we will square that error. Okay. Now, how is this different? So, if we're computing the difference, if we, if we compare the mean absolute error and the mean squared error, right, both of these, the absolute value operator here is gonna make sure that all errors are treated as positive, right, so we don't get that compensating error issue. The mean squared error is going to get around that problem by squaring it, right? Any, you know, a negative times a negative is a positive, and a positive times a positive is a positive, right? So also we're going to be dealing with, you know, positive quantities here that we're summing. What's the principal difference between squaring and just taking the absolute value of the difference? Which one of these is, you know, how are they going to, another way of framing that question is, how are these two measures going to differently punish deviations from the observation? So if you square a small number, like a number less than one, then it gets smaller. Yep. If you square a number larger than one, it gets bigger. Yeah, exactly. So what this is going to do, what the squared error is going to do, is it's going to punish larger errors by the square, right? So the, the further you depart from your observations, your, your, your penalty goes up as the square, right? Similarly, right, the closer you are, right, um, 
the you know the the more this is going to or the the less the penalty right the closer you get the smaller and smaller the, the penalty okay okay let's take a oh one last comment before we take a break okay so the the issue with um the issue with this right is is solely that um or one issue with this, right, is that if we look at the units of this, the units of this are our variable squared, right? So now, right, so we're, we're getting, you know, we have something that's maybe desirable, which is that large errors are, are punished more than small errors. So that's desirable. The downside is that now it's in this funky units, which for discharge is something like meters to the sixth per second squared which is weird, it's a weird unit. I don't have a physical sense for what two meters to the sixth per second squared is, okay? All right, let's take a break, and then uh, at 20 after, we'll come back and go over a few more um, performance measures. Okay, so before the break, right, um, what we encountered is this kind of, this issue with mean squared error that, uh, right, that, it, that it's presented in units that aren't particularly helpful to us, right? Um, it's in the square of whatever it is we're calibrating and observing. So one way around that is to just take the square root of that number, right, which is the so-called root mean squared error, root mean squared error. And that just equals square root of that whole thing, okay? Okay, so RMSE is a variable that you all have likely heard before. Anyone not heard RMSE prior to this? Sort of referred to a shorthand. Exceptionally common measure of error. Right, um, and it has this advantage, the sort of dual advantage of, you know, punishing large errors, um, and or punishing large errors more heavily than, for instance, the mean absolute error. Um, and it's in units that, right, are are meaningful to our particular problem. Okay. Okay. So. What are some other ways that we can measure error? These, are, these three are very common, right? And in fact, um, those of you that have ever, ever run a regression problem in Microsoft Excel even, right? So fitting trend lines. Um, what it's actually doing is it's minimizing the mean squared error, right? And in fact, all kind of linear regression is, is doing that, right? And you can think of that problem regression, right, y equals ms, mx plus b, m times x plus b, right, as a, a model of a system in which the parameters are the slope and the intercept, right, and what you're doing as a calibration of that model to minimize MSE by, you know, finding the, the arguments, the, the parameters m and b such that the mean squared error is, is minimized. Okay, all right. Um, there's some other ways of measuring error that are useful to us, right? Um, one that we'll talk about uh, 
is the so-called bias. Okay. And this usually just involves the mean of the model output minus the mean of the observations over the same time interval. Okay. Now, it, it turns out that in the context of our in the context of our hydrographs, this actually represents something that is important, right? Something physically meaningful. Um, so first off, let's notice that uh, the, the bias here is expressed in, in units of, of what we observe, right? But if we, if we go up here and, and look at our hydrographs, right? Um, one of the metrics that we, or one of the kind of measures of error that we might care about, right, is the degree to which the area under these two curves matches, okay? When you have a discrete curve, right, when you have discrete observations, how do you compute the area under these curves? How do you integrate, how do you find the integral of this function when you're given just points along a figure or points along a time series at uniform time steps delta t. Add up all the points yeah, exactly, right? So like this is that, you know, rectangular method, right, where we would, you know, turn each of these into a rectangle that has a width delta t. We'd multiply q times delta t You'd sum them all up, right? And that gives you the area under the curve. Well, if we're doing that for two curves, right, um, then n delta t is the same, right? So that sort, of, uh, that sort of cancels out, right? So this is actually a measure, right, of kind of at any given time, the average, right? If you, if you multiply this by the whole length of record that you did the calibration over, you would get the kind of total mass error, the difference in volume between your model and your observation, right? So this would be, this is the equivalent to taking that total mass error and smoothing it over, you know, every day, right? So this is kind of the, the amount of mass error every day on, on average, okay? So importantly, this can be negative or positive, and that's, that's an important quantity to know, right? If the model, is lower than the observation, that's what's referred to as a low bias, right? If the model is higher than the observations, that's what's referred to as a high bias, okay? So bias is kind of an important measure that, that has physical consequence for us, okay? Okay, so the a couple more, um, and then I think we'll wrap up for today. Um, Another one is that we would compute is the so-called standardized variance. And even though we say standardized variance, um, we almost always are referring to actually the, the standard deviation. But saying standardized, standardized deviation, standardized standard deviation sounds a bit weird, okay? So um, what, this, what this is, uh, the way that we compute this, right, is just the, the variance of the model, right? So uh, i equals 1 to n, and this is just q of the model time i minus the mean of the model time series squared, and we take the square root of that, and we divide it by the same quantity for the observation. Okay. 
Okay. Now let's let's look at let's look at this in the context of okay, what what are the units that um, what are the units of this metric, this this measure of error? Well, and it, it turns out that these are going to be dimensionless, right? So we have a variance in the discharge of the model divided by the variance or the standard deviation of the observation, okay? Now, why might this be a useful measure? What does the variance of either the observations or the model tell us? Thoughts? What's that? If the formulas look like the ratio of the yeah, um, graphically on a curve, what would this look like, right? So like on this curve here, what does the variance of this kind of represent? Yeah, so it, it's a measure of the spread over our period of time of how high and how low this gets, right? The variability, right? And so like if this were a climate model, for instance, that measure would be like, okay, how, what's the variability or a measure of how high and how low it's getting, right? And so we're interested in this measure because you know one important attribute of our models might be that they're kind of you know reproducing that range of variability that exists in nature, right? Um, so, you know, we would desire that our, our model, right, can predict extremes, right? Can it accurately kind of get as hot as it gets in Boise or as cold as it gets in Boise, right? And, and we wanna know how well it's capturing this kind of observed variance, okay? Now, what happens if the model, if this ratio is greater than one? What does that mean? How might we interpret that? Yeah, it's, it's at least overestimating the variance, which means that it's kind of too variable, right? That it's almost too sensitive to, this, to the inputs that we supplied, right? It's kind of going above the range of variability, either too much on the high side, too much on the low side. We can't really tell from this measure alone, okay? But yeah, it, it basically means that, hey, this model is maybe a little bit too sensitive than what we observe, okay? What if it's less than one, conversely? What does that mean? Not yeah, it's exactly, yeah, it's, it's not variable enough. Right? You can think of that conceptually as like having a weather model, right? That uh, an, extreme, an extreme version of this analogy would be we have a weather model and it only predicts the mean temperature every day, right? Like the mean, the season, like the, the mean, like, you know, my weather model is that I look at the climatological record and I say, what's the average temperature for Boise on this day? And I pick that, that's my model, right? I'll get very good results with some metrics, right? My RMSE will be outstanding, okay, over the very long term. My standardized variance will not be, right, because I'm not departing from, right, the, I'm not departing from the, I'm not able to make kind of large predictions, right? Predictions that are outside the normal behavior, okay? Now, 
this is a bit of a trick question. What happens when this ratio is one? Does that mean that my model is perfect? Yeah, yep. And so uh, an easy way to think about this, right, is that my average model discharge and my average observational discharge can still be the same, but the deviations are, are the same, right? Or these can be different, but these deviations can be the same, right? I could have a bias and still have a standardized variance that's one. Right? You can think of that as just like a sinusoidal curve that's just offset, right? Um, that's offset by you know, some unit. Um, another way to think about this is that I could have that same sinusoidal curve that's just shifted in time. Right? My sinusoid is the same amplitude as the observed phenomena. It just happens to be shifted. Right? So my variance will be the same. Okay. Okay, one more measure, and then maybe a philosophical question. Okay, so another measure is just the correlation coefficient. And I want to show this more graphically than I want to... Um, so if this is my modeled discharge. And this is my observed discharge. Right? And this is the one to one line. Okay. So this this line, this is the one one to one line. So observations or or, you know, values of my model prediction that fall on this line are perfect. Right, so if I plot all of the observed and model discharge, the pairs of the time series together, right, anything that falls on the line will be perfect. Right, anything that falls below the line, as drawn here, means that the model discharge is larger than the observed discharge. And anything above the line means that my observed discharge is larger than my model, right? So if I just fill in these points here, right, um, with hydrographs, the, we're going to have a lot of groupings around here. Okay. And... Let's add a couple more here. Um, so, right, I think all of you have probably sort of taken a statistics class, right? And, and you have some sense that the correlation, right, the, just the linear correlation coefficient of, these, of this plot is a measure of how well, right, in how well one variable is predicting the other. Right? And so there's a couple of different things that we can infer by looking at this plot. One is, right, is there a systematic deviation in the slope? Right? Do we systematically have a departure in the slope of, for instance, that regression line? Right? as well as the spread, right? Our slope could be, our slope could be, you know, perfect, but we could have a lot of spread, right? This gets this whole like precise versus accurate thing, right? Precise means that these cluster on a line. Accurate means whether or not the slope of the line is close to the one-to-one, -one, okay? So, but this correlation coefficient kind of gives us a measure of a little bit of both of those, right? How, how well one of these predicts the other. And it's basically a combination of that mean squared error, right? As well as the, a little bit of the variance for each of these, right? So it, it kind of combines the standardized 
a little bit of, it combines the variance of each of these along with the, the mean squared error, the sum of the root, the RMSE. Okay. Okay. So now we've developed, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six different measures of model performance, right? For, right, for our model, and, and what we're going to be doing on Thursday is a model of snow water equivalent, a very simple model of snow water equivalent with two parameters. And we're going to be looking at it and compared with actual observations of snowpack and trying to fit those two parameters to get better improvement. So the question is, is which of these metrics do we use? Right, which, which metric should we use in calibrating that model? And this, the silence sort of tells me that you all suspect that there's no one answer, right? Which there's not, okay? And that's kind of the point, is that um, there's almost never a single error metric, performance metric that we want to use to calibrate a model. We always want to be looking at multiple attributes, right? Because none of them gives us all of the information about model performance. And truthfully, the ones that we've outlined today don't get at some of these important issues like timing, right? And let me just give you a quick example of this, right? Um, so, right? Um, here is one model curve, and here is what's effectively the same curve, just offset, right? So if we computed the bias, the bias would be low. If we computed the standard variance, the standard variance would probably be close to one. If we computed the RMSE, this is actually going to look not great, right? And so by some measures, this is a great prediction. By other measures, it's not so great, right? Okay, so, so yeah, the answer to this whole correlation question is, well, you know, we don't want to use any one individual measure of performance. And in fact, next Tuesday, what we'll do is we'll cover a couple of different uh, um, what, what are called objective functions, right? Actual, you know, functions that we're seeking to minimize, cost functions that combine these different measures, right? That say, okay, like we, we recognize that we want to be kind of doing well by many of these measures simultaneously, okay? But this is, these are kind of the ways that we've laid out today how we can measure the performance of that model. So what we'll do on Thursday is we'll actually go through um, what's known as the SNOW-17 model. It's actually sort of on some level still used operationally to forecast snow or predict snow water volume in a lot of operational hydrologic models. Okay, um, And we're going to examine um, uh, how that model performs. This is for the East River watershed in Colorado. Um, it's data that Will has helped me wrangle. Um, we're going to look at how well the model performs kind of out of the box, okay? And then we're going to work on sort of tuning those parameters and developing these measures of performance to see um, how well they do in, in different circumstances, okay? Questions? Can you call this Yes, exactly. So that's another, right, in this case, we're training our model. And next week, what we're going to do is talk about um, this period of, of, of training versus verification or, right, which is like training versus testing versus validation, right? So, yeah. Okay. All right. See everybody Thursday.